so good morning. good morning welcome to mosaic and our continuing study of genesis we've been out of it now here for a couple of weeks as we've um, been off for the holidays so um, i generally try to give us a little bit of a running start so we kind of see where we've been and so let's um, look at this is what we saw last time i'm not going to do a ton of review but i do want to at least read through it to get us up to where we're going to start this morning um, if one of you is willing, there's two screens here. I'll have you guys read that just to, you guys are better readers than I. So the Lord said, I would blot out, blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in this, his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that, uh, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them on, with the earth. Um, yeah, this is, go ahead, one more. Oh, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower second and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. So this was a, a diagram thing I found that I thought was pretty interesting to see it laid out this way and obviously we don't know exactly what the ark looked like or i mean what you've seen there is kind of what we know but you know based on uh the length of a cubit and things like that we can get some approximate distance and i say approximate because there are different cubit lengths in an ancient uh, world and so the one we think they might have used would be this one that they're using here so 300 cubits would be about 515 feet, um, 86 feet wide, 51 feet high. One of the big significances of that, um, this would have been the largest boat ever made in human history up until like the 1800s when they started using steel. Um, there's never been a boat of that size up until this until we started using steel. The other thing is the proportionality of this. We now know with computer technology is the ideal buoyant. Uh, you know, it has to go all the way up 90 degrees before it would flip over. So it could be an incredibly rough water and be stable. If it were taller, it wouldn't be as stable. It'd be more like a, a you know, a cylinder and just roll along. But because it's shorter than it, and it you know, wider, shorter than it's, to its width, that helps its stability. Second, um, the length to width ratio is, is really key to, in that. When it's that long and it doesn't have propulsion, it can be, it can be moved through the water uh, and to let the waves kind of take it where it needs to for its stability. Um, you can't do modern um, vessels that way because they got to get from here to there. This thing wasn't going anywhere. I mean, it could go wherever is the point. God would just have it end up where he wanted it to. So there's no need for propulsion. It can sort of drift in the water. But being that long, a wave would hit it, but not necessarily the whole length of it at any one time but being that long. So there's just all kinds of things that are marvelous about what this is. And all of that's from God, not from Noah. Noah was not a boat engineer, you know. He didn't know any of that stuff, but obviously God knows that, and so he communicates to him, here's how you're going to do it. Um, the three decks. Um, talked about this uh, when we were looking at it before. I don't know if this will let me. Oh, yeah, well, cool. All right. So um, the volume is uh, about 1.4 million cubic feet based on size. Um, but we know gross tonnage, 14,000 ton. 
equivalent to more than 500 railroad stock cars. If you've ever been sitting there for half an hour waiting for a train to go by, that's about 100, maybe 150. On a long train, 200. This is 500 railroad cars. That is a lot of space. That is a lot of space. It is 100, let's see, 125,000 animals if they were the average size of a sheep, which is actually larger than the average animal when you look at all the different ones. You know, mice are significantly smaller and baby elephants aren't that much bigger. You see what I'm saying? So the average would be um, the size of a sheep. There's room for 125,000. When you bring this back to, you're gonna take two dogs, not two poodles and two Great Danes, but two dogs, and then the dogs multiply into all the breeds later. So you got two dogs, you got two cats, you got two you know, chickens or whatever. Um, when you do that, there isn't anywhere near 125,000 kinds of animals, or half of that when you got pairs. So my point is there's more than enough room for two of all the different kinds of animals is the point. Food storage, plenty of room. So there is no issue at all with the amount of space available and the amount of livestock and food that would need to be stored. So completely not a problem. And it's just helpful for you to know somebody did the math <laughs> and it's like, no, that actually works, that works. Okay, good. So move on from that if that's a stumbling block for you. Um, you, when you read things online of atheists and, and skeptics, they always, oh, like you could get all those animals on. Yeah, actually you could without, with room left over. But they've not, that's that blindness uh, that we talked about uh, earlier. All right, somebody, somebody would read this, please. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of, two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. So one of the things I had is why did why does God make a covenant with Abraham or with Noah? I'm sorry. What? Moses and the ark, faux pas, right? I talk about that all the time. I just did that. Abraham and no. Okay, why did God make a covenant with Noah? I think it's important for us to realize it is not because Noah is such a good guy. God's like, wow, I'm really fortunate that I got Noah. You know, he's sort of rescuing the day. That's not what it is. It says Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Other places that's translated, same word, gr grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God was gracious to Noah. Was he a righteous man? Yes. Did he sin? Yes. Um, righteous doesn't mean sinless. It just means someone who is pursuing his relationship with God, taking those things seriously. Um, God had given Noah faith. We know that's true. It's throughout the scripture. We see that God is the one that grants us faith. And Noah will demonstrate that faith, this is an important key distinction, by being obedient to God's command. He has not got favor because of obedience. His obedience simply demonstrates his faith. Just like Abraham was about to offer Isaac as an offering, it was not the offering that caused him to have righteousness or be credited as right. It was his faith that allowed him to go all the way up to offering his son, knowing that God would raise him from the dead. He didn't know what was going to happen, but he knew the boy and I will be back. <laughs> I'm going to go kill him, and then he and I are coming back. I don't know how that's going to work, but I have so much faith in God, I'll even go so far as kill him. Okay, accredited as righteousness. That's the faith that does that. Same thing here. It's never rained. 
everybody has gone completely crazy in the world doing all kinds of horrible things. God says, build a boat that is so big, it will never be able to move. It's never rained. You're not near water. Everybody's going to make fun of you for 120 years. You're going to speak to the wind and no one's listening and just keep being faithful. And the obedience that drove that was the faith that God had empowered him with. God had ordained in his own purposes to use Noah to repopulate the world. That's why he made a covenant. It's not because Noah was awesome. <laughs> it's because God said, I'm going to use you. I'm granting you faith. You will demonstrate that incredible faith by an act of obedience that is incredible. And, um, and all of that came out of the fact that <clears throat> Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. So what can you and I learn from the lessons from Noah? And I have two that I had talked about the last time we were together. Obey what God calls you to do. I should make the periods bigger there. <laughs> uh, period, all right? Just obey what he tells you to do. Do what he's telling you to do. Whether that's a passage of scripture that's very clear, um, whatever that would look like, be obedient to him. And second, do that, be faithful, be obedient, even if you stand alone, like he did. You're the only one in your office, right? That's okay. Be faithful, be obedient, do the right thing, even if you're the only one. That's a great lesson we can draw from Noah. Literally, he and his family are the only people left on the planet being obedient to God. That is definitionally standing alone. Do you know what I mean? So that's where we were at. Now let's look at our new section. Um, I'll go ahead and read this one for us. Then the Lord said to Noah, pause, <laughs> 120 years has elapsed. We know that because right before he started talking to Noah in chapter 6, he says, I will not always be patient with man. His days are 120 years. And then he starts telling Noah, go build the boat. And now we're at the point where they're about to have the flood. And then he says this. Then, after the time frame, then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. He's demonstrated that over that time period. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heaven also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that God commanded him. Again, he did what he was told. He was obedient to the Lord. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came, and the flood, flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. So this, what you see in chapter 6 and 7, and my memory is maybe even into 8, it's the same story, kind of just they keep retelling this. It's very repetitive. But what you may notice here, which is what my question is, how is this different from what Noah was told 120 years earlier? And there is a difference. <clears throat> Take with you seven pairs of clean animals. Right? He didn't say that before. This is six. You shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive. And now he's saying seven of the clean. That's totally not what he had said. So is there, is there a contradiction here? Is that a problem? And I would say, no, it's not a problem. Um, let me show you this. There's an interesting kind of, well, which is this? We'll, we'll talk about it. Let me show you this. Take with you, the, the highlighted area, seven pairs of clean animals. This is ESV, and a lot of translations read that way. Here's the modern King James. You shall take with you every clean animal by sevens, male and female, and you shall and take two 
of the animals that are not clean. So the question arises, is this seven pairs or is this seven animals that are clean? Is it seven pairs? Now obviously ESV says literally seven pairs, so that you would think that that settles it, except for the fact that that's not what the King James says. Well, so, good. I mean, just mathematically, it's got to be seven pairs because you can't divide two into seven get a number. So. Except for the fact that look at the second line there, and two of the animals that are not clean. So the first one, take uh, every animal by sevens, and then he says take two. So wouldn't it say by one? <laughs> If the seven refers to a pair, why wouldn't it say one pair on the second chunk? So here's the issue. In the Hebrew, in the original, it says seven, seven. It just says the word seven twice. That's all it says. <laughs> it's left to the interpreter to figure out what does that mean. <coughs> so the interpreters are left going, well, <laughs> it could mean seven, or it could mean seven and seven, a, a pair of sevens, you know, seven male, seven female. And the reality is we don't really know which that was. And it doesn't matter largely, other than the fact that one of those answers is correct. Um, we don't really know which one. Go ahead. Okay, um, initially back on the other screen, what I interpreted to mean is that you have, if you took two of each bird, uh -huh. um, there are different species of birds and you took two so could it be that there were two pairs of and he took seven um, pigeons and, and seven uh, finches and right. you know a, a not I'm not saying seven but he took two two finch two a pair or two a quail and two whatever and he, yeah. there's a total of seven total of seven different types. site. I don't think so, and here's why. I'll, uh, here's where I land on this. I think it might be seven animals of each. And you'll let me see if I can't remember if I show you this right away or not. Um, let me let me deal with one more thing. I want you to see this. You'll notice in this passage um, here. This is our main passage. Seven pair of clean animals and a pair of the not clean, male and female. That's almost like a clarifier, right? Then he goes back, I think back to his original clean and seven pairs of birds of the heaven. Is he to take seven of every bird? I don't think so. I think it's just the clean birds. He's, he's delineating between clean and unclean is what he's doing in this section. Seven of the clean animals and, and birds, he's clarifying later. Not just the clean animals, but the clean birds as well. Because, for example, a dove is a clean bird, but an ostrich is specifically listed as a non-clean bird in the scriptures. Um, a, a vulture is not a clean bird. They, they didn't make sacrifice of vultures, but they did sacrifice you know, a, a pigeon or something of that nature. So there are clean birds and unclean birds. There are clean animals and unclean animals. So I think what we're seeing here is a bring in seven or seven pairs, whichever, of all the clean, not just animals, but birds also. So that's one thing I want you to notice. That's what you see here. You shall take with you um, every clean animal by sevens, and then also take the fowl of the air by sevens. And I think that's just a clarification of the clean ones, the clean birds too. Could be wrong. Again, in the end, it may not matter that much, but I think that's an appropriate way of interpreting that. Go ahead, and I'll explain that, why I think that. What does that do to the original math when she said there's plenty of room? Totally plenty now, of room. all of a sudden, we want seven of every, not just a pair. But only of the clean. But Okay, what you've never explained right. what the difference is between so clean and clean. this yeah, is interesting. Difference. Yeah, what's the difference in clean and unclean? Here's what's kind of fascinating about this. What I can't remember the time frame. I'm going to call it a thousand years later, or maybe 1500. I can't remember. Moses, long later, writes Deuteronomy and Exodus and all that, and he identifies the clean animals. Way later is when we're told what the clean animals are. And yet, at this point, there's some sort of understanding as to clean animals and what not clean animals. 
Now here's one reason for that. Noah's not rounding up animals. God is bringing animals. So he doesn't have to worry about which one's clean, which one's not. The clean ones show up in sevens, and the non-clean ones show up in pairs. <laughs> now, it's either seven pairs or seven each of whichever. But here's what I want you to see as to part. Well, I'm going to have to just let this continue to unfold. Here's my answer, because I, I can't remember exactly where I should. This is one of the things with this section. There's a point here, and then the rest of the point is over here. So I can jump back and forth and back and forth and totally confuse you, or I can try to just let this walk through the passage and you'll see some of it, then you'll see some more of why I say it, and some more, and I think that's the way I've decided to let that unfold for you. How is this different? God adds the detail that Noah will take seven of all clean animals and seven of the clean birds. This is not changing the story. He's not saying, now you're gonna take seven of everything. No, 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 you're taking two of all the animals. But of these, some that are clean, I want you to take some extra. He's just adding another layer of detail. He doesn't tell him everything up front. He says, okay, I want you to build a boat. I want you to build an ark. I want you to make it this big out of this wood, and I want you to cover it with pitch. And you're going to use it to take these animals two by two. Good enough. Get what work. It's all he needs to know for now. Later, he's about to start loading animals. Okay, now you need to know, in addition to the two of everything, you're also going to take seven of these certain kinds of animals. But God didn't change his mind. He's just unveiling more of what he's going to have to do because now that's the point he's at, right? So not a problem. It seems like maybe there's a contradiction. It's not contradiction. It's just added elements. Go ahead. I don't know what clean means in English. What was the Hebrew word that they took that word from? I don't know. So let me let me answer to you this real fast. Maybe this will be helpful. What a clean animal is defined in uh, you know later in Genesis, Exodus, that kind of stuff. I can't remember exactly where it describes it. It's the animals like a lamb, um, a, a, a certain goats, um, livestock like cattle, certain birds. Those are clean. Why? Because they would use them in sacrifice. It's the things they were supposed to eat. Don't eat pigs, they're not clean. Well, we actually know now they're not pig. They root around in the mud and they eat all kinds of crazy stuff, And right? Don't eat shrimp, why? Because they're the vultures of the ocean. Uh, so he's telling them, don't do that. Eat things that eat grain and, you know, eat clean animals, that's why he's defining them that way. And then he wants them to sacrifice those clean animals. Now, at this point, after the flood, they're allowed to eat everything. He doesn't put a restriction on what they can eat at this point, but Israel he does later. My point is we now can look back and say there's probably some, maybe some benefit to them eating these, these animals and not those animals. They didn't know anything about hygiene and all that. Let's eat a vulture. It tastes like chicken, right? Well, yeah, except for the fact that it's been eating dead stuff, and it may not be very healthy to eat that. There's a health issue, maybe there's a health there's issue for the nation of Israel. So the point is, um, that's, that's, I don't think what's at play here, it's the sacrifice part of the system, which will make more sense as we continue to move forward. So why is he to take seven clean animals? That was the next question on your sheet. So now let's look at this. Um, this is chapter eight. So Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his son's wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, every thing that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. This is, we're jumping forward, right? I've talked about how we have to go back and forth a little bit. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of the, every clean animal and, and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So what if he takes two of everything? <laughs> And then he kills off the sheep. Well, there's no more sheep. There's only two of them. You just killed off one of the pair, right? So why is he taking seven? So they can have sacrifice after. So what if he takes just like three and kills one off? Well, then they can't sacrifice for a long time. And they're getting ready to start doing a lot of sacrifices going forward in history. They need a lot of sheep. They need a lot of cattle. They need a lot of... So here's what this could be it's either seven pairs and he's killing off some pairs and all and or it could be that there's seven total 
and the one odd is the one they sacrificed. When they got off the boat, they killed the seventh, and now they have three pairs. They're able to go and multiply, but they'll increase in number quite fast compared to the twos because they're starting ahead of the game. They've got three pairs to start with. And they will replenish that population of animals much quicker because they're going to be killing them at a much faster rate than giraffes. We're not chasing them around. You can, they only need two of them. But cattle, we're eating them all the time. we got to have a lot of cattle. So we're going to have three pairs of those to start with right after. But immediately as you come off the ark, we're going to kill that seventh one. And so my point is, there are people that will argue it's seven because the seventh doesn't need a pair because he's going to die as soon as he gets off the ark. That's why you only need the seven. You don't need a, a, an even number because you're not going to have them around long after you come off. Whether it's that or it's seven pairs, it doesn't make a great deal of difference. If God wanted us to know specifically, he would have made that more clear. He didn't. And so either way of understanding that is okay. I don't think there's a theological problem in either direction. I just wanted you to know that if you ever read that and see that distinction, it's a little bit confusing. It's fine. Um, either way, he's providing for food and for later um, for them to have I'm giving you for food and green plant and give you everything to eat. So here's the answer. Let me do that, and then I'm going over here. So why does he tell them to take seven? So that they will, um, so that they will make a sacrifice to the Lord. They'll have animals to do that. They will be preserved, even though they're killing them off immediately after the flood. Those animals will still be preserved. The Lord is also going to have them begin to eat animals after the flood, and they will need to replenish more quickly than the rest, which is kind of what I've been saying. I just want to get it. So if you got seven cows and you kill one in an offering, you still got three pairs, and you can have maybe eat another pair while the, the other four are, are multiplying, and then you start eating the live, you know, the offspring, and pretty soon you're able to, to get along. But the giraffes and the lions and the dogs, you just leave them alone and let them go because you don't eat those right away. You don't have any extras of those. All right, you had a question. It's an amplified Bible. It throws another wrench in there. It says, okay. do seven pairs of the, of the clean animals and do two pairs of the unclean animals. So, you know, I mean, it's just so uncertain, but it, you're right, it doesn't really matter. It's like, two obviously pairs. it worked out. Yes. Because here we are. I would say it's not two pairs, but <laughs> I think but, they may. I, but, but I mean, you're yes, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. This has been a nagging thing. I, um, what about the fish? And <laughs> you never talked about fish. Yeah. It's like I'm going to kill everything I made. Well, that breathes well, air. Yeah, it says. well, but then there are mammals that live in the sea that could have survived the flood. They sure, breathe there. I think all of them. Yeah. So, but he said, I'm, I'm killing everything. I'm going to get and he, start. But he never, does he ever mention the fish? No. Or? And the reason is, he's about to give them a bit, much bigger pool to swim in, so they're fine. That's not an issue. <laughs> yeah, I, okay. Because so. he says, I'm going to kill all the animals, all the, the creeping things, and the birds of the air. So he's telling you which ones, not just, fish. Just the ones on, on land. On things, those dry that, land. Yeah. So, okay. yep. If you don't need land, you're fine. It wasn't just a flood, it was a violent. Yeah. Events. Cataclysm, yeah. yeah. You'll see that here as we move forward, too. Could they even start fishing, turn into fish then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Add some food that way, too. Um, okay. For in seven days I will send forth um, the rain. We looked at that. Every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. So he is specific there. Um for seven days, I, was, I think I flip-flopped those, sorry. So the point I want you to see here is, was the flood regional or global? And this is one of those things you'll hear debated about. Um, so here's, this is why I have that question. Every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. Question, is that a regional or global flood? Okay. I'm going to show you this. This is back in chapter 6, okay? I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animal, creeping thing, and bird of the heavens. So he's very specific. That's what he's killing off. Verse 12, 
and God saw the earth. He didn't see the region where Noah was standing. He saw the earth. And behold, it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, for Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey, when God patiently waited in the days of Noah. So we know now he's describing something that has happened in the days of Noah, so we know we're talking about that. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. So if it's a regional flood, then why did everybody else in the world die since we know there were only eight people left after the flood? It, can't not, it cannot be a regional flood and this, this in the New Testament, which is helping us interpret the old, that doesn't even make sense why everybody else on the planet would die if there's only a flood in one little area. Obviously, everything on the whole earth died because that's why there's only eight people left. Okay? So, I did think to make my period a lot bigger there. Uh, <laughs> it was a global period. So, uh, if somebody wants to get in an argument with you about that, just let them chatter on and then move on. All right. Back to our main passage. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. The main takeaway for us, just from a practical standpoint, that's our main takeaway. Regardless of what you're being asked to do by the Lord. Now, let me say this. I'm not saying that on a Tuesday afternoon, the Lord is telling you to go rob a bank, you know, kill your neighbor, whatever. That's not the Lord. You need some professional help or something, right? That's not... He's never going to tell you to do something that would violate his other commands. The scripture is the primary way we know what he wants us to do. Now, if you have a prompting, you need to call so-and-so. I think you should do that. Um, if you should witness to this person, yeah, you should do that. But those are obviously in alignment with uh, the scriptures. So always check anything that you think might be coming from the Lord against the scriptures to see if it matches that. Don't ever go in contrast to scripture. Well, but the Lord told me, no. Okay. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. Um, so it may, And we know his sons were born when he was 500 years old. So his <coughs> sons are about 100 years old when they entered into the, uh, entered in. And Noah and his sons and his sons' wives and him, and they went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Um, okay. So, and he, here it talks about every living thing. No, sorry, I'm not sure why that. Some of these I've made copies to the text, and then I must have left it the, the extras in by mistake, sorry. How long did it take to load the animals on the ark? That's just a kind of an interesting. Seven days. That would be my guess. And here's why. Uh, this is the next section. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of every creeping thing on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. So this is like where we're headed. This is the next section. He's saying these animals are starting to come in now to the ark. And obviously, <coughs> Noah's traffic directing and getting things in the right stalls and all of that. So he's involved, but I think the Lord is the one bringing these animals to him. Um, monarch butterflies leave here and end up in the same little forest in Mexico every year. How do they do that? It's called instinct, right? And God could give them an instinctual reaction. I need to go to there. And they all just start taking off and go and end up where they're supposed to. And then he directs them into the right stall on the boat and after seven days the waters of the flood came upon the earth so we know from the time they started entering into the ark it's going to be seven days and then there's a flood i'm going to skip over a short section there 
And the rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And, or, and uh, on the very same day, the same day that the rain started, Noah and his son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. So they didn't enter it seven days earlier. They, I think they've been busy for those seven days getting all the animals finalized. Here they come. We're getting them in. They've been doing this for seven days. On the very day the flood starts, that's when they finally, that we're done and they walk in. Now think about that for a moment. You know, and you are absolutely convinced there's going to be this whatever a flood is <laughs> and whatever rain is, and you've been spent a hundred and something years building this ginormous boat. Here come the animals, and you know it's coming. It's coming in seven days, and you're trying to get everybody in before it's too late. And it was so happens to work out that they literally walk in as the floodwaters are starting to come. Do you know what I mean? God is never early, is the point I would draw from that. He brings them in right at the right moment, and then boom, okay, here we go. And that is so often true in our lives that uh, you have some major thing, you need it, and it, you and I, we want it way early so that there's no stress or pressure. And the Lord's like, no, no, you're going to trust me because I'm going to let this thing show up on the moment you need it and not before. That's just the way a Christian's life will go very often. And this is that <laughs> to an nth degree. I'm going to destroy the world, but your door's open until rain starts falling on it. You know, it's like, uh, you can shut it now, shut it now, shut it now. No, 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 I'm going to do it at the last minute, right, when you actually need it to be done. They went into the ark with Noah, two, um, two of all flesh, in which was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female, all flesh, went into the ark and uh, as God had commanded, and the Lord shut them in, or shut him in. The Lord is the one that closes the door. My imagination there is he builds this giant door and this you know ramp platform, you know, and he it's like there's no way to close the thing. Uh, and so the Lord shuts the door. So and sealed it. Yeah, and sealed it. It's watertight fit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of an amazing thing. All right. How long did it take for the, so to your seven days? I, that would be my take. Noah didn't know exactly what fl when the flood was coming until God gave him a seven day warning. Remember that. God knows I'm sending this in 120 years, but he's never told Noah that. He just says, build a boat and there's a flood coming. So he's out there working every day, and you know when he lays down at night, he's exhausted, and he thinks, is it coming tomorrow? I hope not, because we're not done yet. <laughs> you know, it's like, he doesn't know the time. I mean, it's taking forever to get this project done, and I hope we get it all done before the flood comes. You know what I mean? Finally, he's about finished, and then the Lord says, okay, I'm sending it in seven days. So now he knows, and there's no indication he's heard from the Lord in 120 years. There's no other conversation that's recorded. So he's been faithfully obedient all this time, building all this, and then the Lord shows up and says, okay, and in seven days I'm sending the floodwaters. God then brought the animals to the ark for Noah and his family to load them. When they finished, Noah and his family went in, and then God shut the door. So that's kind of the sequence of how this worked out. Didn't we discuss a while back that maybe he had other kids? No. Didn't, we didn't discuss no. that? Okay. Is it possible that he did? Um, we know that, like in the genealogy, it lists only the ones that are relevant. <clears throat> you know what I mean? It says, and they had other sons and daughters, and we don't know who they are. There's no indication that Noah had other sons and daughters. Um, prior to the flood. I don't remember. He may have after. I can't remember. Um, we'll, look, we'll get to that. But Okay. So and after seven days, the floodwaters came after the Lord had shut him into the ark. This is interesting. Um, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, 
That is really specific. It doesn't say 3.37 p.m., but other than that, we got a pretty, pretty clear, this is when it happened. You can literally go through and do math and say that would have been the equivalent of our April 7th or whatever. I didn't do that, but we know the day that the flood occurred. Why does the Lord want us to know that? I don't know. There may be something connected somewhere else that I haven't discovered yet. That's one of those things that would be interesting to mark that down. Maybe figure out what, what day on the Jewish calendar would that have been? Does that correlate to Passover later or something? I don't know. It's not that because it's not the, on the second month and the 17th day. But the point is, if it's that or is it, this isn't mythology. It's got too many specific details to be mythological. You know, I don't know exactly why, but it's something we're told. And there's, it's, everything there is there for a reason is the point I'm kind of getting at. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. The rain falling for 40 days and 40 nights, obviously the super famous part of that. But the fountains of the great deep are a huge part of it as well. Let's kind of continue to walk through some of this. The rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, they went into the ark. I had skipped over that earlier because I wanted you to make some connections. And, but then we kind of jumped back up and talked about the, the, um, the great deeps bursting forth in the rain. Okay. They and every beast according to its kind and all livestock according to their kinds and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. Uh, they went into the ark with Noah, two by two, all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered male and female, all flesh went into, went in as God had commanded him. And God shut them in. I showed you this earlier, but this is kind of more the sequence of how it's laid out in the scriptures. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. This You'll see this, um, the waters increased, they prevailed, they, it raised. It, it's going to talk about that a lot, where it just keeps raising, it keeps talking about this increase in water. Um... I must have skipped that. We'll go back up to verse 18. And the waters prevailed increasingly greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the water. And, then, and the water prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. Was it regional? Was it regional? <laughs> all the mountains of the whole heaven were covered. That, that, that cannot be a regional. You can't. Here's the point. When people do that, they're not coming here and reading that and go, oh, you know what I think that means? I think that means it was the land of Israel was flooded. Or, no, what? <laughs> no one comes to that conclusion based on reading the text is my point. If you have another reason you want to think that, then you try to bring that regional thing and bring it into the text and say, well, maybe that's what they really meant. But you don't come to that conclusion by reading it yourself is the point I'm getting at. It's God, like God could have just had them move the animals to where it wasn't going to be flooded. Right. There's all kinds of reasons. Yeah. All right. How could there be enough water to cover the mountains over the whole earth? That is a legitimate. Wait a minute now. We have sea level. We have 34,000 feet above sea level Mount Everest. That's a lot of water. How in the world was there enough water to cover Mount Everest? Right. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a legit question. So let's look at this. On that day, the fountains of the great deep burst forth. We've seen this already. And the, the windows of heaven were open. Water prevailed above the mountains, covering them by 15 cubits deep. It's like 20-something feet above the mountains. So I'm really bad artist. Please don't laugh too loudly. Okay. So what you have is the canopy of water above. You have the ground, you have mountains, you have a little lake or sea there, and you have these huge bodies of water under the ground. And we think prior to the flood, there was not rain. Instead, what was happening is this was seeping up from the bottom. Somebody was talking about this, the way really nice golf courses are watered. 
is there's tubes under the ground and they when they turn them on it just it waters the grass from under that doesn't sprinkle it just wets the ground underneath and that's kind of the point here we think this is like you could put your garden here and it would do awesome because there's a there's this huge reservoir of water and it's percolating up from the bottom and watering the plants that's why everything grew so well so this is prior to the flood at the flood bad art this happens now you're busting up all this water underneath the ground up and this is coming down and so now your new water level could be maybe this high and cover all those mountains what you're having happen when this thing busts open is all these plates that are around the the circumference of the earth are shifting and breaking loose and all that's why it's so violent we talk about that so here's what it might then look after we now have oceans that are two-thirds of the uh, surface of the earth and you can fit Mount Everest in like the Marianas Trench with a lot of room left over it the oceans are deeper than the mountains are high <coughs> so we have an enormous amount of water on the earth but some of it goes way down there right so let's say the mountains are not nearly that tall before right they're this little mountain uh, the uh, the um, the Appalachians let's say right they're mountains but they're like what 3,000 feet or something and then after because of all this movement you have things like Everest and the Rockies they just get pushed way up higher than they've ever been prior to that and when they're going up it's opening up these chasms deeper and deeper out in the ocean and then all that water has a place to drain way down deeper than it's ever been and mountains higher than they've ever been. And that is a perfectly logical explanation of how you would have enough water prior to cover short mountains. And then after God can get rid of all that water by simply opening up larger areas underneath for them to go down and push mountains up higher than they were. I've talked about this numerous times, but when you go down 75, down through Kentucky, you'll see all these layered <coughs> rocks. But what you also see is some of those things stood vertical and the layers run this direction. Obviously, there's a bunch of movement in the earth. Um, so here would be the answer to that. The topography of the earth was not the same before and after the flood. My, my bad art simply is a way of saying that. Uh, when the great deep burst forth, is well the way the scripture says it, it would have changed the landscape dramatically. Many of the high mountains could have been formed from this movement of the earth. Say so Everest didn't exist prior to the flood, it existed after it. As these things are moving around, it gets shoved way up high. The great depths of the oceans may not have been as deep before the flood as well. So the Marianas Trench opens up after and swallows up trillions and trillions of gallons of water draining it off the land. So it's both deeper oceans, higher mountains, after the flood than before. Is that exactly what happened? I don't know. My point is that's there's no reason it couldn't be that. It's not a problem. It's not like, no, the, no, no, the mountains have always been that high and bound, nothing's ever changed. No, I'm sure things change. We know that they changed. Exactly how they changed, we don't know, but that's a perfectly reasonable expectation of how it might be different before and after. Okay, back here. Uh, I was thinking of glaciers. Like we know that the glaciers came uh, or frozen, yep. like, I don't know, way down. Mm, and they came all the way down into Ohio and yeah. Yeah. So before the flood, we know that, we know, we, we think that the earth had a much more consistent temperature all around. Why do we think that? because they have found, and I think it was woolly mammoths, it was something of that size, in Antarctica with green vegetation in its mouth, and it's a digestive tract, frozen solid. Like this happened like that, and they just and froze. So this idea of this thing coming down that could have changed that, that environment so drastically, so quickly, that they went from a tropical area to they were frozen. And so as this water rises up 
to this level, it just freezes solid. And then it's warm at the equator and it just keeps kind of shifting downward and downward, but it's warm enough, it just keeps melting and melting and eventually we're with what we have now. So, and that could have taken thousands of years to work all that out because I don't think uh, Ohio was covered in, you know, glaciers uh, recently, but it doesn't necessarily mean it happened in the days of Noah necessarily. It could have been taken 500 or 1,000 years for that to all get exactly worked itself out. I don't know. I haven't looked at exactly like a timeline, but that's, I think, when the glaciers formed is during this flood cataclysm type thing when there was this huge change in the temperate climates of the earth that went from kind of one uniform temperature to these super cold and super warm. And that all fits, is my point, with what we see here. It very well could happen that way. Um, that I have something else and I, uh, here and here, and then I, I am going to try to finish this, but go ahead. Remember I flew out to LA and you fly over the desert and you see all this evidence of looks dry stuff, but all of these valleys and rocks of all of this water. And always, I always went back to Genesis in my brain and wondered how people couldn't believe. Yeah. Jesus. Blindness. Yeah. yeah. Or in the Bible, you know. Um, for those of you that were here two weeks ago, I had them play a video. Um, it's the Mount St. Helens. It's a uh, seven... Seven Wonders of the of Mount St. Helens or something. It's a, a, a museum up there. And this guy uh, does a video presentation on it. He's pretty a animated. and <laughs> But anyway, the point of that is when Mount St. Helens blew, there's all this water of Spirit Lake and all this mud and it's all liquefied and it's just rolling down and it's making all these layers. Then there's another explosion and they've sent all this water down and it carves out a canyon that looks just like the Grand Canyon today, only on a smaller scale with all the layers. And we know that formed over like a two year period, not millions of years. It, it is literally the Grand Canyon on a smaller scale and we watched it unfold. So how did the Grand Canyon form? Well, there was this thing that happened where the whole earth was filled with water. And then when the, when the mountain or the, the depths of the ocean got larger and they started draining all this water off and all that sediment was still really soft it just eroded it all out and, you, and then it exposed those layers and then they solidified into rock. And the Grand Canyon is an incredible evidence of the flood. That makes sense, unless you don't want there to be a God and then you'd say it's a million years. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not that the evidence isn't there, it's I don't want to believe the evidence so I'll create something that makes less sense but helps me avoid having to deal with my conscience. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swim, uh, swarm on the earth, and all of mankind. This is toward the end of that chapter. Just a reminder, yes, it's global. It's global, everything, everything on the earth, right? Everything on dry land whose nostrils was the breath of life died regional, global. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animal and creeping thing, and the birds of the heaven, they were blotted out from the earth. This is one of those things where it's like, okay, in case you missed it, let me repeat myself. Okay, maybe you missed it. Let me repeat myself. Okay, if you weren't listening, let me repeat. I mean, he says it four or five times in this one section. All flesh that moves on the earth, he, birds, livestock, creeping thing, everything, all of mankind, everything on dry land who has breath in its nostrils died. He blotted out everything on the face of the ground. All, you know, men, animals, creeping things, everything, everything under the birds, the birds under the heaven, they all were blotted out from the earth. He doesn't want us to miss that. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark, in case you missed it. <laughs> right? And the waters prevailed for 150 days. What can we learn from God bringing this kind of utter destruction upon the earth? I think I skipped that question earlier. God takes sin and its punishment very seriously. 
Um, have you heard it said, oh, a loving God would never mm -hmm. send people to hell or he would never, he doesn't want people to suffer or all these different things. And where does that come from? Well, that comes from where all lies come from, right? If, if we don't think he'll wipe out sinful creatures and sinful be, you know, people, read, read you know, Genesis 6, 7, 8. It, it, their sin was so abhorrent to him, he literally wiped out everything on the planet and started over. What consequence? It's... Um, so I end with this. What lessons can we learn from Noah? The two that I've already mentioned. Obey what God has called you to do. Why? Because he wiped everything out when they weren't obedient. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Do I wake up every morning terrified that the Lord's going to get me? No, but I am conscious of the fact that when I am disobedient, he chastens those that he loves. He disciplines those that he loves. Be obedient to the Lord. He's serious about that. Second, be faithful, even if you're the only one that will be. Be the Noah of your generation. <laughs> and hopefully you won't. You'll have others that will come alongside you. Hey, Chris. Go ahead. I don't know if anybody else thought about this, but what happened when all the water and everything receded then you had all these dead I don't think there was and animals and here's why I don't think there was the turmoil of that um, think about all this this rock and mud and everything being churned up into the water um, I think what happened is all the civilization that existed prior to was completely covered in the sediment as it settled out and covered everything. And it's as though it had never happened. I, I was talking about this a while back. I don't believe in Atlantis, you know, like the mythological thing, but I think what Atlantis is, is when people of old would talk about the world prior to the flood, and of course it gets blown up into all kinds of, you know, mythological things. But that's what they were describing, is simply the civilization that existed. And the reason we can't find it is God just wiped the slate clean and started over. So is there under the ocean some road? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, they probably had some roads back then. And we'll see glimpses of that. There's nothing like Atlantis, but what they refer to as Atlantis was simply pre-fall civilization that was completely eradicated and not just killed, but erased. By the, by the sediment flowing over it in the, after the flood. All right. Let me close this in prayer, and then you guys can head in, and I'll hang out and talk if you'd like. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word, for your revealed truth. I know that sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, we, we're not always looking for application as we study. We're just, we want to know you more. We want to understand what you have revealed in that in and of itself, knowing the truth brings an application um, in and of itself. Um, our lives can be different as a result of knowing you more thoroughly, knowing you more fully. And when we're studying passages like we have here over the last few weeks, we're seeing your heart as it's revealed toward sin. <coughs> It helps us understand how you see sin more clearly, more accurately. It can be very powerful in our lives as we try to pursue holiness. We know we can't achieve perfection this side of heaven, but you have called us to be holy because you are holy. You've adopted us into your family. Holiness is what we do as the family of God, and we wanna pursue that out of a love for you because we love you we want to obey but also because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and we we want to treat you with that proper reverence and appropriate fear 
You take sin very seriously, and therefore so should we, both in our own lives and in the lives of others. It's not our job to make them stop sinning, but it is our job to express a, a desire for righteousness in the world. Um, help us to do that well with our families. Um, love them, love them well. Stand for truth in a, in a day, in a society where truth is, people don't even think there is such a thing as truth. They talk about their truth as though truth can be identified uh, by our own desire or want, which is not true, but it's the world we live in. Help us to be people of truth in a post-truth world. Help us to love you and love others well and bring us back together here in weeks to come. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.